Hey guys, it's Bree. Um, I wanted to talk to you about Rise of the Rocket Girls by Nathalia Holt. This is a really interesting book that follows women in aeronautics, uh, basically from the 40s to the 70s, and then has a little bit of coverage from the 70s to now. It's subtitled The Women Who Propelled Us from Missiles to the Moon to Mars, and it is a really interesting story. Holt zooms in on an organization called the Jet Propulsion Lab, or JPL. Uh, this is an institution that was started at Caltech in the 40s, and at first it seemed really unlikely that they would ever be able to achieve their goals. The primary uh, founders of the organization wanted to be able to send rockets into space, um, and people at the time kind of wrote it off as a pipe dream. They wound up eventually getting a contract to do missile work for the United States Army, which then turned into them working with Werner von Braun and <laughs> basically uh, taking part in NASA operations up into the present day. <laughs> it starts off with a woman named Barbie who is married to one of the guys who works uh, at the startup that turned into JPL. She was very smart, very engaged, and wanted to be part of the team. Her husband and her friends were able to use her as, as basically a calculator. She really sunk her teeth into the mathematics behind the engineering that they were designing. Over time, the <laughs> computing department was almost entirely women, uh, specifically women who oftentimes were discouraged from seeking out mathematics as a career, who had gone to school and were kind of either waiting to find a husband, kind of, or who weren't finding um, a lot of challenge in their day-to-day -day lives. They were brought on and worked as these calculators and were able to really eventually engage in the engineering process itself. There weren't a lot of women in the field, as you might imagine. And JPL had one of the highest percentages of women, predominantly because of a woman in their hiring department who was the manager of, again, that calculators or that, that computing department. And as a result, women were able to make a really large contribution to their company. They were able to recruit women uh, who had background in chemical engineering or uh, aeronautics design and things like that, who simply weren't able to find a job elsewhere because people were worried that they'd go off and get married and pregnant. Um, it follows a handful of women, probably about six in particular, who were uh, vital either to the organization itself or who later left the organization for other organizations. And it does some interesting things one, it follows the educational path that leads them to their career as computers. Then it follows the women being kind of the first adopters in the organization of technology. And it continues to look into their personal lives to see how they were able to balance work with kind of the societal expectations of women. Uh, one of the very interesting things was that a lot of the women in the department either were hiding that they were pregnant or took leaves of absences, um, basically paid vacation time that they had accrued in order to go and have babies and came back very quickly. Um, a lot of them married men who were in the organization. Um, it's just, it, it was a very complicated web of trying to figure out how to make it work. Um, some of the women had very, very supportive families, others did not. And it kind of goes into the differences and how, what that really meant for them when it came to balancing work and family life. It's hard for me sometimes when I read about successful women in science and a lot of their story is about their family life. Simply because I don't think that the same emphasis is there on male scientists and there are moments when that frustrates me. I'll, I'll admit. Um, and I always have to take that step back and say, you know what? It was 1950. Them conquering the societal expectations of themselves and the familial expectations that come with being a wife and mother in 1950 is a big deal. 
and that's why it's there. So it it's something that I struggle with, but I, I appreciate that Holt has it in there and she does it in a very tasteful way that kind of examines those pressures on an individual basis, but doesn't necessarily interrupt the overall flow of the story. But moreover, it was really fun to see the women as the first adopters of this new technology. They were the first ones to go ahead and work with actual calculators, like mechanical calculators, the first ones to be able to really work with the computers that they brought in from IBM. Um, and as a result, you really see how women were making themselves indispensable. The male engineers thought that they were very much in charge, they really had a lot of say, but when it came down to the nitty gritty of the deal, it was really the women who were doing the programming, the women who were doing the mathematics, the women who were, you know, kind of subtly putting in ideas about jet propulsion, um, who were doing a lot of the designings for the co nose cones that go on top of rockets. Um, and so it, it showed a really interesting balance of what we see in popular history of aeronautics and what the reality was. Um, you know, a lot of times we only really see the, the few couple names that make it big, right? Um, what this really, I think, is very good at showing is that it's the littler, behind-the-scenes people who make the organization tick, who make all of the rocket successes possible, and who feel the failures sometimes the most strongly. Um, I think Holt does a really good job of balancing the overarching perspective of the industry with kind of the smaller focus on the individual. Overall, I was really quite pleased with this one. I think it's one I would suggest. So you know the drill. Comment, like, and subscribe. I hope you're having a fantastic reading week. I'll talk to you later.